So good morning, sculpture class. We are here on Wednesday, April 29th, and we're gonna start looking at some of the mechanics of paper mache. So uh, everybody should have one of these guys. Uh, as opposed to flour, um, this is the paper mache mix. Now, we don't need this right away until we get through our base construction, um, but what the box contains is, um, ounces of this kind of paste powder. Um, it's similar to a wallpaper paste and you're going to be able to mix it up. Now to mix up the whole thing you need a couple gallons of water um, and so mix it up in small batches. It does last for a while but there's no need in mixing up the whole bag um, because you're probably not going to need the whole bag. So uh, make sure you, you keep this safe and, and nice. Keep the bag sealed because it is moisture sensitive and uh, we will end up using this probably um, towards the end of next week, I would think would be the first thing. It depends on your construction method. Uh, today, I want to look at a couple of reference materials. So um, we talked a little bit and uh, we watched just a quick part of Dan Reeder and his website has a lot of, of good examples and a lot of good information on it. Um, but what I wanna to do today is I just wanna kinda of use his book just like we were in class and go over some of the things that are inside of there. So I'll switch cameras. And um, in this book, he makes this kinda, of, this little guy on top here. Um, if it's too glossy, I'll try to play with the lights a little bit and see. So uh, this is Dan Reader, Dan Reader's book, The Simple Screamer. Um, and I think this is 1984 is when he had this, when they published this. Uh, he knows the uh, Gary Larson, uh, who does the Farside comic. So Gary Larson actually made a comic about Dan a long, long time ago. Oops. Boop. Okay. Things that we uh, are going to need. We're going to need newspapers and about a two, about a two inch stack uh, should do us. Um, but we're going to need newspapers. Uh, if you can find some metal coat hangers, they're going to help. And uh, some, some masking tape will help you. First things first. Um, so I'm just gonna, we're just gonna kind of browse this real quick and then we're actually gonna get into working, working. Um, we're gonna ball up uh, some newspaper and the newspaper that we're gonna do should look to the shapes that we are gonna make. So bodies are gonna be big spheres, um, heads are gonna be probably, depending on the type of creature, um, they could be uh, spheres, they could be ovals, they could be, um, kind of funky egg shapes. Uh, appendages, depending on, again, your type of creature, your appendage could be in a couple of parts or a long, thin piece. Uh, the hangers, we don't put hangers on, uh, we don't need to put hangers on the outside of the body. Uh, he doesn't even do this anymore, um, making a frame around the body. We do put hangers around arms, and uh, with the double hanger, it's just gonna guarantee that it stays in one place. You can run a single hanger and then tape your parts to that. Um, if, the, if you want to try to uh, put the hanger on the inside, uh, you can, but I would rather you have a solid piece of uh, paper ball in there than squishy paper with a hanger through it. Uh, the hanger is just gonna hold it to keep the thing in place. We can always replace parts with cardboard as extra supports. Um, in this, again, uh, still using newspaper, he uses flour as his agent. Um, if you are going to not use the paste uh, and you're gonna go with flour instead. So again, warning, warning, warning. Flour is a food source. So if you use flour and you set it in a place to dry where insects can be around, um, they will come to eat the flour. So I would use the paste. Uh, simple enough, 
Um, we're going to read the instructions on the back for mixing up how our our paste to keep your stuff nice and neat. When you make the mache paste, uh, this this will be a, kind of a transparent liquid kind of goo or gel. Um, if you're using flour, it's going to be kind of a milky white, kind of a um, a melted frosty like consistency. Put your hand in the mache mix. Apply that to the surface of any of your paper. Don't, don't, don't dip the paper into the, the paste. Uh, if you do, the ink transfers off of the paper into the paste and you get these dullish, ugly looking gray kind of liquids, which we just don't find appealing um, when you stare at it. Second, by applying it to the surface, you know that the first layer is actually your outer layer of your surface. Then you start to put your newspaper on. You're gonna guarantee that you're gonna get glue over the whole surface. And then when you put your paper strips down and you apply your paper over the top, you know that you're applying it to an area that definitely has glue. It's gonna save you from having paper that's gonna to wanna to peel off or, or pull away from the surface because there isn't enough glue tension. Uh, once you're all done, and again, three to five coats of mache um, on a layer. At one setting, I'd probably do three layers, let it dry, and then do two more. One of the things to think about is don't always put the paper the same direction. Uh, put, put one layer in one direction, put another layer going a different direction. So that way you have overlapping. It's gonna tighten it down, and as the mache dries, because we're laminating things together, it's gonna weave it, uh, it's gonna weave it together. Um, for the third layer that you put down, you can go back to the first direction or you could come across the diagonal. And depending on what you're doing for, for areas, if you're like going across the gap or something, like if you're making a cheek or if you're uh, making like webbing in between fingers, we don't necessarily, unless you want it to droop in there, you don't follow a, a flat pattern. You probably wanna start at an edge and go diagonal for a pattern if you want it to stay rigid. So like cheeks and wings, um, a cheek could indent a little bit, that's okay. Um, webbing in fingers, like uh, fish fins might indent a little bit, but a wing, like a bird's wing, you want it to be flat across that plane. Um, you can, uh, we didn't put out, um, he uses uh, self-drying clay, or you can get, um, Pot, you can get, uh, um, so self-drying clay, like Mexican pottery clay, where you can make it, let it sit for a couple of days, it'll dry out. Um, it's a little fragile, but it's not too bad to work with. Um, or you can get uh, polymer clay. Polymer clay is kind of expensive. Really, we can do all this by taking pieces of hanger and twisting the newspaper around it. And we'll skip ahead. So here he's putting his, he's pulling his, um, head apart. Uh, you might want to think about uh, when you're working in areas, putting your paper mache in between things like teeth or ridges. This is how he's making fingers. The tips of these could also become teeth very easily. Just take a little bit of hanger, wrap some paper around it, twist it tight, put a little tape, paper mache the whole thing, leave a little bit of hanger sticking out, and you can make those into teeth as well. So the cloth mache, we don't have to do, but I know a couple of you asked about cloth mache. Um, and he's using just, just standard white glue, any white glue will do. And uh, he breaks it with water and he uses an old bed sheet. So again, um, if you have an old bed sheet laying around, if you have old t-shirt material, uh, heavier duty cloth is gonna cause kind of different textures and different dry times. Um, in here he says, he just adds a little water, um, one half cup per quart to loosen the glue up a bit. So um, really, uh, it, it doesn't take a lot of water. Um, I would mix my glue into a small container and I would work small batches at a time. 
because once the glue uh, starts to set, um, it's going to make like a skin over it. Um, so you don't want to have you don't want to have big batches of glue kind of laying around. The cloth is nice because when you're working with the cloth, you can scrunch it and you can make um, texture patterns like this surface area is held up by the texture patterns um, that's created by scrunching the cloth and pushing it in place. So the cloth does, uh, does make it a little bit nicer. Uh, you can go straight from build to cloth mache if you want. Uh, I would do paper mache, especially in areas where you have um, appendages joining together. So like at the elbow or the armpit, um, I would have a paper mache first and then cloth over the top of it. But for things like if you were doing like that long snake body, um, you could just bend it into shape and just paper mache right over the top or cloth mache right over the top of it. So once you have your parts together, uh, we're going to start to cut things apart. For most appendages, we're going to leave it pretty solid. For most bodies and for most, most mouths, we're going to hollow those out so that when we get into actually putting this together, this part will be hollow. And that, what that's going to do is it's going to lighten up our sculpture so that you can have it standing up or you can have it um, where it looks like it's defying gravity, but in reality, you have a lot of very lightweight material, and then the heavyweight is in the appendages itself. Um, if you are going to do multiple arms, you want to remember to, to balance that out inside of your sculpture. And then um, looking at cutting open holes, here he's hollowing out the whole body. Uh, I, would, I would hollow out the body first, and then add in my appendages. That way I can get my hand inside and, and tape and hold it from both inside and outside. And then if I need to, I can do some paper mache on the inside to help give extra support. Wherever you have a connection point, I would go over it with another three to five layers of paper mache because you don't want it breaking apart at a seam or a joint. You wanna make sure that it's nice and solid. You wanna, if you look, he has his legs bent kind of funky. Um, the reason they're bent that way is that the head and the arm's weight is going to want to fall forward. So when you look at the final guy, all of this weight transfers forward. So these bent legs help support this upper body weight. Because if these stay pretty solid, they're going to be heavy. And I want to make sure that that weight is distributing down into its legs. I don't want to have it crushing in on its body. So this body should definitely have five layers so that it can support that weight up here. You could hollow out some of the appendages, depending on their thickness and their size. Um, that, will, that would be helpful. So here he's just kind of putting things together. Um, for eyes in this one, he's actually just putting in little clay balls. Um, we can use marbles. You can use anything. Um, most of his, his sculptures that he sells now, he orders glass eyes. So there you can just see, um, he really does a, a nice job. He kind of gives himself a little dot so he knows where it's sort of looking. And then he does eyelids by just folding over a piece and folding it around. Um, and, and really making the eyelid, making the eyeball, uh, having nostrils, things that are depth and dimension Remember, we are a sculpture class, so we don't want to just paint on eyes. Let's, let's make eyes. Let's make an opening for the nose. Um, like a couple people said they were going to do fish. Make the gill slits open so that you can have, instead of just painting on lines, that you can actually get in behind that and you can see that open gill slit. Those are, those are things that are showing that you're, you're really, you're thinking through your whole project. Um, his tongue not painted on, he actually builds the tongue so that it, it can move and give motion into the body. Um, how he stacks his appendages, they're in motion so that no matter what direction we're looking at it from, it's, it's got a neat view to it. It makes us want to move around it. Uh, he doesn't put ears on. I think ears would have been cool. And in some of his other pictures back here, so this is just him painting it. Do to do, do to do. Uh, that's him with a bunch of his critter beans. So this guy here has some ears to him, put a little spikies on the head. Uh, 
the reason he calls these guys screamers is he always has the mouth open and the tongue hanging out like they're screaming. Again, working with poses. I'm adding little things like these guys have horns. Um, some of them are like kind of long and curly. Little toenails added in. Some of them have extra little equipment with them. Again, uh, Dan's from California, so surfing sort of stuff's around. There's a, there's a nice fish. Scales coming back, and you can see the gills. They're, they're actually popping out. He's got the little feelers on it. Um, I've had a student make a Statue of Liberty. Um, I've had two. I've had one Statue of Liberty that from feet to torch was 24 inches, and one from uh, feet to torch was uh, 46 inches. So then you got like these little guys together. Um, I still really think the snake is cool. Uh, it's not a hard build, but when he gets here, he leaves it kind of bulgy, like it just swallowed something. Just kind of cool stuff. So uh, that's Dan Reader, and this is his Simple Screamer book. What we're going to talk about is we want to come up with our base shapes first. So make a couple of ideas and sketches. Uh, you can use some reference information so that you have a good idea of what you're going to make. Um, once you know your critter and you've drawn it out, now the drawing is just your reference. Um, once you've got it drawn out and you know what you want to make from it, we want to break it down into some basic shapes. Uh, some of this stuff, like if you have like a cardboard tube from a paper towel or a toilet paper roll, that could be a useful item to use. Um, if you have any like little uh, Dixie cup, um, little cardboard cups, you might be able to use those or plastic cups. You might be able to reuse some of the, some of those inside of what we're doing. Uh, cardboard is going to be helpful if you got any laying around. When you know what you want to make, we want to try to break it into parts. And once we break it into parts, we're going to build this out of um, we're going to build this out of basic shapes. So for me, I'm deciding what shapes am I going to make my paper into? Or if I have extra pieces, how am I going to add those extra pieces into my sculpture? Uh, this book here is a paper mache design book um, by Bonique Robert. So we talked about this one a little bit. And I I had this marked when my tag fell out. Uh, this is, if I'm paper macheing around something like a balloon, one of the things I want to do is, remember, don't do it all one direction. Do a direction and then have an overlap in different directions. That's going to help in the fact that uh, it's going to make it a stronger build surface. Think of how can I put parts together. If you're using metal coat hangers, and they have that cardboard tube at the bottom instead of being a complete metal hanger. Uh, you can use that, reuse that tube to go into some of your appendages. Uh, here we can see they've got a little bit of an armature and then paper mache across cardboard in sections. Cardboard is going to be rather rigid, but remember, cardboard is absorbent. So you want to make sure you get down a, a thin layer of paper mache first and don't oversaturate the cardboard, or, or it could bend and get warped a little bit. Um, has some buckets under here to hold up the pieces while they're drying. And that's, a, that's another thing. As you start to put things together, it's not going to be structurally sound until you've coated it at least once with a layer of paper mache. Um, once that coating is done, then it'll start to solidify those joints and it can support its own weight. But when you're first building, you want to make sure it doesn't collapse down on you. You can use a lot of cardboard tubing if you don't want to use a lot of paper um, as the support system. Again, the softer uh, the newspaper ball is, 
your thing, once it gets wet, it's gonna deform and warp. And if you wanna have a nice, smooth looking sculpture when you're done, you don't wanna have soft pieces put in there. You wanna have something that's gonna be rigid. Um, if I'm using something like a balloon, balloons are pretty squishy, but the nice thing about it is, is that the air pressure is equal inside of the balloon. So I can go ahead and I can do all my layers, but I wanna make sure that I do that weave pattern. Uh, a vertical layer, a horizontal layer, as I laminate through. Um, that's just talking about laminating again. That just shows us some finished pieces. So, how you cut apart your uh, pieces is going to be important um, when you're working on that. You could paper mache something and you can cut. Oops, went the wrong direction. You could cut parts out of the paper mache to become parts for other areas. So in this, it's a nice sphere um, that they have. And you could use something like if you have a basketball or a soccer ball around home, cover it with a little bit of saran wrap um, and then use paper mache over the top of that. Uh, a really good question um, about masking tape and paper mache. So, one of the things to think about is, and let me switch cameras real quick and then I'll show you. Mm -hmm. So I have very minimal amounts of masking tape on my critter. Um, I have, you know, I just have a couple of newspaper wedges stuck up under here to hold the cardboard in place so that when I start to paper mache, it's not gonna collapse. This area is cloth mache right over the top of my paper mache. Paper mache will cover masking tape, but if you have a lot, and, and I think if you watch some of Dan, uh, Dan's videos, you notice him just, he puts on a ton of masking tape. But um, to me, the masking tape sometimes has a waxy coat to the surface the waxy coat can resist the paper mache um, adherence. So what I, what I do is when I smooth it on, and that's another thing, that's another reason to dip your hand into the, to the mix and place it on, because you're gonna notice if, it, if you're going across and I hit masking tape and dry surface, if it wants to have a, a good solid coat on the surface, but not on the masking tape, I can always add a little bit more. I can control how much um, stuff I put down on it. The Elmer's glue um, or any, any of the white glue you use, um, even though we're breaking it down with a little bit of water, it doesn't seem to mine the masking tape as much. So it, it'll go over the top of it if you want to do that. Um, things like this, I mean, this, is, this guy's a little bit beat up and I talked about it uh, the other day. This side has cloth mache, which is really rigid. I do have some things I have to come back in here and trim because when it dried, this peeled up. So I'll trim this off and put in new parts. Um, but these legs stayed pretty much in place the way I wanted them during my transport. Um, and I, I put this guy in a box, but it slid a little and then it tipped over on me. And these guys are real loose. So I have to go back through and fix these legs because it used to be both of these touched and now this one sits lower. Um, this guy here is okay. And this guy here is, he's, he's loose. I'll have to redo him, um, but he was sticking up anyway. So the paper mache is gonna help hold it. The cloth mache is gonna make it really, really ri rigid. Um, other questions that came in. So I'm gonna set down my spider. Um, uh, do we need to, uh, I'm going to guess that's uh, use cloth. Uh, you do not need to use cloth. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, what does cloth do for me? Okay, so here's, the, here's the, the stages. If I have five layers of paper mache, I do my whole project, I get it all together, I, I follow sound construction, my creature's going to last an easy three to ten years. Easy. Um, if it falls off of something, if it's sitting on the dining room table, it falls, it might dent, um, but more than likely it's, it's going to be okay. Um, as long as people aren't like abusing it, if it's, if it's sitting on a shelf or it's sitting in a corner, it, it's going to be okay. Um, on the other hand, 
If you do cloth mache, the cloth dries more rigid. So to the touch, it's rougher. Uh, when I touch this, this is paper mache, and you can see my thickness here is maybe, um, there's two layers here and about four layers on this side. So combined it's six layers, but I have a waxy layer in between, so it didn't stick. Um, not bad, real smooth. When I come to this, real solid, and you can hear the roughness. So the cloth leaves it a rougher surface, but it also makes it, it's much more solid. Um, and that's that white glue drying in there. So it's going to last an easy 10 years to 15 years, um, as long as, again, as long as it's in a nice place. Now, if you have little siblings or a pet, um, that could change in an instant because paper mache is not going to resist dog teeth. Um, so you, you just want to you just want to be careful with those things. Uh, next. Um, so we do not need cloth. Cloth is an option. Um, it's not gonna change your grade. It just depends on what you're planning on doing with it at the end. Um, when sketching, does it need to be 360 all sides? I would do a base sketch and then I would give myself a front view, side view, um, and maybe a top if I need to lay things out. Okay. Um, so that when you're so that when you're planning, you don't have something that's really flat and stiff. You've got something with some motion to it, something where things are happening. So I mean, I have eight legs on my spider. Um, I only need four for it to support itself. Uh, I'm going to use some of those legs because I want to arch it up so it's not one flat plane. So the body's on a different plane. The body itself bends. So I made sure that the body has a curve to it. So that's more appealing. Um, I want it to sit. So this is up higher. And then I have legs kind of coming off. And then each one of these legs is adjusted a little bit different. And then um, when I get in here to the head, so I still need to, I still might take off this bottom jaw again. Um, so I can add some eyes to it and reshape its mouth. I don't like it having the, Kind of person mouth, um, the Muppet mouth. I want to make it look more kind of spidery in its mouth. But I, I want to have, I want this to have some idea of motion and movement as it sits there. Uh, the cardboard is added just to be something extra, just to be another layer of different looks to it. So it breaks up the surface. So when I'm looking across, I, I'm going to have these kind of cool little ridge guys going on. Um, even to here, I'm going to have a different ridge. Um, I'm going to use different types of cloth when I'm working on this. So the underbody here, I'll put on a smoother, softer cloth, like a t-shirt material. I have a little bit of this flannel left, so I'll put some flannel around these once these are rebent into the right shape um, to give it that extra rigid strength. Um, and then I'll come across these probably with t-shirt material again, because I really want these to accent. And you can see... The thickness of the cloth here, I still have, a, I still have an indent, but it's, it, it really, um, the cloth is almost as thick as the cardboard I'm using. So therefore it's, it's kind of hiding some of those details. I don't want that. Um, what else do we have? Can we do a monster um, like from Scooby-Doo? Sure can, it, it's up to you. Try not to, um, uh, again, the more realism you go for, the more difficult this project is, the um, more kind of loose and free, the more loose and free uh, your creature is. I would work always from a reference. Um, so if, if Scooby-Doo is my influence, um, copyright Hanna-Barbera, um, if Scooby-Doo is my reference, um, then I'm going to look at whatever villain I can find from there. And it's going to be a simplified version because it's a cartoon. Um, if I'm going to work from something real, so I would uh, do my Google search for what I like. And um, so right now I'm going to type in cool looking fish. So we'll share this.
So cool looking fish and I'm gonna check out images and um, lionfish. They've got a lot of, they've got a lot going on. Kind of like this guy here. It's a little big buggy eyes. Um, looks like he's got extra little sets of fins. So this guy will become my reference for my drawing. So what I'm gonna do is we'll switch back. Got my nice piece of paper here. Pop out a pencil. And first thing I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna look at my image and I'm gonna make a drawing of my image. So I like his kind of head shape. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do basic shapes while I'm doing my drawing because that's gonna help me. So this is a cone. Uh, I'm gonna make the mouth open eventually but I wanna know where that mouth is. I kinda of like an, the overbite lip a little. Eyeball, eyeball, kinda of froggy eyes. I might give him eyelids just to make it cute. Doesn't have to be scary, wanna say that. Um, some people think that you have to make a scary, you don't have to make scary, you can make cute. And then body. Gonna wrap. And he looks like he's got kind of a wide tail. Probably give that tail some ridges. This would be a good use for coat hangers. And again, this would be a good one to let it droop in between. And I'm gonna scallop that end to make it more fishy like. Fish A. Pectoral fin, again, good use for a hanger. And I wouldn't make this, I, I, draw, I drew it flat plane, but I wanna make it undulate because I think visually um, that will look nicer and I might tilt it. So I'll come over to the side and go whoop. And then one up, one down, one up, one down. So that this line is more visually appealing. To my viewers. than if it was just a flat straight straight thin, mm, those is itchy. And then it looked like it had, um, so it's got another fin that comes out this way. And I'll just label it for myself. It has this kind of really light um, ridge that kind of, it's got a ridge in its body it looks like. And then it's got extra set. And these are very, kind of wavy out. And then I definitely, so this is gonna be times two because there'll be one on this side that I can't see right now because of my drawing. Um, and then I'm gonna give it a dorsal fin, something down its back just to make it look cool. And this is something I could cut out of cardboard. I could cut these out of cardboard as well. I fear maybe there'd be a loop there. And then just to show that that's in the background. So, that's my base fish. Then I'm gonna look at how, how would I make this guy. Um, circle for the head. And this could be a great use if I've got like a cup or something. I could use that. Or I could just make a, 
I could start to make kind of a cylinder with newspaper and then squish the, the front. Circle for the body, smaller circle for the body, smaller circle, and then a really, um, a circle that I kind of squish. So give that squishy lines. That's my whole construction. So I'm making mostly out of spheres. I like this guy out of cardboard. Um, this guy here, maybe cardboard or maybe paper mache, depends on how many coat hangers I have laying around. And then I would do all my fins out of coat hangers and paper mache as I can. Um, I would say for this, looking at this side view, I'm gonna to try to keep this around 12 inches. So from this tip to this tip, 12 inches. That means my whole body might be 12 inches if it were laid out straight, but I'm bending it. So this area in here, um, we'll call that six to eight inches depending on what looks best because I do want it to be a fish. So I want it kind of to be elegant. I want it to kind of be um, slender looking. I want to catch it in its movement. So its whole body is going to have a, a C shape, a crescent shape movement. And it's going to go from big, heavy to little tiny in this direction. So it's going to flow down. My fins are going to be wedges that actually bring the viewer back towards my body. And then these ridge fins here are just gonna kinda be more decorative. And then that back piece, um, that's gonna be another wedge that points in towards my whole body. Um, my eyes, I definitely wanna make those out of paper balls, large paper balls. And then I will um, cut them out, hollow them, Put those back together and then I will make eyelids on them because I think eyelids would look kind of fun. It'll, it'll make it look more comical. Um, I'm not going to keep a closed mouth. I'll end up cutting all this. So I'll have my sphere and my cone piece and then I'm going to cut that so I can drop this open. So when I paper mache this all together, it's gonna to come out. Um, I'll give it a nostril. Though it's not, it really doesn't need one. It might look like a little bit like a seahorse. And I'm also going to give it um, gills back here. This will be the area where the eyes live. And then when I open this, That'll be its lower jaw, upper jaw. And then I can decide, do I want a tongue in there? Um, do I want to give it teeth? So teeth will make it look a little bit more vicious. Um, I could give it square teeth if I want to. I could give it no teeth and just um, have it maybe a nicer. That goes back into the idea of what you're, um, what you're thinking of making. Uh, do I want to have it have like a lure? Where it has a, one of those danglies off? Or am I going to keep it with the kind of fun, cute idea? Uh, maybe, I maybe if I don't want to open its mouth, I give it kissy lips instead. Um, if its mouth is closed and I still want teeth, I could have teeth kind of poking over the edges. So this is my design stage. I'm gonna estimate sizes. And while I'm estimating sizes, I wanna make sure that I have a ruler around so I can see what I'm really estimating. So 12 inches, how big is 12 inches? Uh, from side to side, from fin to fin, I think I would probably want that to be six to eight inches as well. I don't want it to be as big. Um, that's six inches. 
And I don't know if I like six. So then I'm going to measure out that's eight. I think eight would be maybe better. Uh, possibly when I'm working with it, I might decide that I need, I want to go full 12. It'd be 12 tall and 12 wide from point to point. I'm always measuring from end to end. If I look at my body, if my body is only eight inches long and I'm curving it, do I like that curve? Does it give me enough space to do a twist into there? Or do I think I'm too restricted? Do I need to open that up to 10 or 12 inches so I can get a better looking body? Um, I think at 12 inches, it's almost going to start to turn the kind of fat sluggy or, or snake-like. And I don't know if I want to have that. So I want to um, mess around with my measurements. Hey, I, I don't have a flexi ruler like this, Mr. Abel. What can I do? Take a piece of string, measure it out, and then you can twist the string around as a way to do your flex and kind of figure things out for size. When I start to build parts, if I have a string, I can attach the string to my pieces and I can move the string holding on to one piece and I can lay the other pieces in there. Um, I can use that to bend if I'm going to bend a hang around this body. I really don't need to. I could add a coat hanger to the body to force it into its shape. But my spider, all I did was instead of cutting them hole to hole to hole so they were flat pieces, I adjusted the holes as I put them in. Um, so I, I do ball and socket joint. Um, so what that means is I cut a hole in one object and then I leave the ball on the other and then I cut a hole in the back of this object. So I'm constantly stacking them together so that it fits inside and I can pivot that around. So that's our planning stage. Um, I would think that come Monday, a, I would have my planning done. Um, I would know where everything is gonna live and where everything is gonna work out. And then um, I can start to get assembled. If I'm a little stuck on my plan, if I don't know if it's gonna look good, uh, I can draw the different views. And if I still don't know, um, I'll put in, uh, I'll put in a, a sketch assignment. Um, I'll put in a homework assignment for a class that is planning. And you can just put your pictures there and then just put in and just send me a message because it'll send me the message back and just say, hey, Mr. Abel, will you look at my plans and see if they look, look strong enough? Um, does it look like it's, it's a good enough idea? Uh, what can I do to make it better? Um, where can I get newspaper? And are we painting over this? Painting is not required. So uh, we're doing, I'm giving you three weeks of build time um, to get from start idea to end idea. Normally we do three weeks, start idea, build, um, finish the build, seal it, and paint it. There's just no easy way to get you guys paint. So sealing and painting, you don't have to do. Um, if you wanna do it on your own, if you've got like scrap house paint, like for in interior or exterior paint, go for it, but it's not gonna be required to be painted at all. It just needs to be built um, so it has to have solid construction, finished build, it has to be freestanding, um, it has to be visually pleasing. That's what it has to be. Uh, where can you get newspaper? Mm, if you have a, a neighborhood that does separate recycling things where people put out cans in one container and newspaper in another, go there. Um, if you have, uh, if you get the Sunday paper, saving Sunday papers. Um, we said that, a, we said that a, just before Easter, start saving your Sunday papers. Um, or if you have relatives that get papers, uh, we can go ahead and collect those. Um, otherwise, I don't know. Maybe, maybe go by one of the recycling places where it's got paper and carefully uh, go check those out and see if any newspapers are stacked out and around them. Um, if my thing is flying, can I put stilts, uh, like wire or something, hold it up? Sure can. Um, uh, if you think of in my classroom, there's the big fish. Uh, the person ended up hiding the brace they made. Um, they had a dowel rod 
and the dowel rod went into the base and it looked kind of plain for the fish and they thought that it kind of took away from it. So they ended up smearing the base with glue and then pouring sand over that. Um, now glue and sand, uh, the glue can change the color of the sand, um, which made her a little upset. So then she did another batch and she put seashells over it and then the whole base got covered. Uh, but the, it, that doesn't have to be covered. We can, we can accept that it's there and visually not look at it. Uh, the um, one clay dragon that's in my room has a threaded rod that goes right through it to a wooden base. Still the threaded rod, still the wooden base. And we just look at the dragon as it hovers. So supports, yes. Um, you can have it hanging if you want. So if you want to use like fishing line or a wire and you want to have it hanging dangle, um, as long as as long as your finished construction could be hung, then I'm cool with it. Um, so you don't have to worry about those wires showing or anything. Um, what wouldn't be good is if you have a box full of paper parts and nothing together. Um, if you can't let it stand up on its own, um, you could have it sitting. So you could have the legs changed so it sits down. Uh, what do I do if I can't find any? I'm gonna guess if you can't find any paper, you're doomed. Use cardboard. Call around to some of the uh, like uh, appliance places and uh, the depot places and say, hey, I'm a poor high school student. Um, do you guys have any like cardboard from refrigerators or freezers that I could have? Don't, don't dumpster dive though, because that is illegal and you could get in trouble and you could get hurt. It's dangerous. Um, the, uh, uh, the final construction piece, like this is not final. There's tape exposed, uh, there's loose appendages. If I set it down, these legs make it sag. Um, it's obviously not finished. Um, it is put together and I have an idea of what it's gonna look like, but as soon as I set it, um, these legs stay real nice but these legs here just want to give. So like this whole leg should be all the way back here and down to kind of push this at an angle. And then this guy needs to be here. And then this guy probably has to be completely bent because it looks like it bent up here too much. Um, and then it all needs to be paper mache. I am cloth mache uh, just to go over because uh, I, I want to show you guys like the different textures and surfaces. Um, you don't have to cloth mache. I know like things like this here, I have to trim because it bent up. Um, so it should be down to give me a nice separation between body parts. And so I'll trim that and replace it. Um, but this is, this is together, it's not a box of parts. It is a together piece. And the whole time it took me to do this is I probably put all this together not including dry times, um, 40 minutes to an hour, 40 minutes to an hour. That's how much time is invested in this. So it's not, it's not a lot. I was doing this because a bunch of students were like, oh, there's no way that could be done. And um, this was the sketch that I did in the other trimester sculpture class. And I said, okay, here we go, guys. So in between helping students, um, I would, take scrap material, put things together, and, and that's how it's built. These legs do have coat hangers through them. And then there's paper twisted onto the coat hanger just to make these kind of pointed like appendages. But other than that, um, these are the only coat hangers that I use. The rest of this is just paper balls put together. Why is it illegal to dumpster dive? Um, because the dumpster is um, rented by the company that, that is using it. So it's not even owned by them. And it's dangerous. If someone falls inside, you could get hurt. You never know what's inside of a dumpster. Um, even if it says paper only, that doesn't mean that somebody didn't throw something in their sharp or something that they shouldn't throw in there. Um, so you, should, you shouldn't play inside of dumpsters.
Cool, 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 everybody. So if you have questions, hang out. Otherwise, peace. And I've got I've got eight minutes and then we do advanced sculpture. So I'm gonna pause this.